the, the purpose of this panel, and you'll, you'll hear from each speaker kind of an interesting perspective on it. I'm not going to introduce the speakers. It's the same format for those of you who were at the conference yesterday, where each speaker has, what, Roland, still like five minutes max, um, to uh, sort of state who they are and you know their, their angle on this issue, and then we'll sort of foster some um, conversation after that and take questions from the audience. Um, so I'm going to maybe just, let's see, maybe I'll start with um, uh, DEP uh, to give you an understanding of sort of what the agency is doing now with regards to combined sewer overflow and some of the technology they're experimenting with to, to measure it. If, and if you, everyone could just state their name. Good morning. My name is uh, Shri Nangarajan. I'm uh, the Director of Water Quality Planning and Analysis with uh, the Bureau of Environmental Planning. I've been working in the uh, harbor area uh, as a consultant for 12 years now, so we are uh, very intimately familiar with uh, our water quality conditions and uh, recently I've uh, joined uh, the DEP to lend support on a uh, lot of water quality programs. Uh, I'll give you a very good, uh, brief overview of uh, the various uh, uh, programs that uh, the city has invested in, already uh, ongoing and also that are planned in the near future. Uh, starting with the water quality monitoring program in, uh, through the Harbor Survey uh, program has been going on for decades. Currently we are monitoring at over 70 locations throughout the harbor, including some of the you know, critical uh, tributaries and uh, nearby beach locations. Um, we are actually helping uh, the Department of Health also in some of the beach related um, uh, you know, the advisory development as part of this process. Um, this is on the water side. On the collection system side, there are over 110 locations that are strategically placed near some of our recreational uh, water bodies in the regulators, you know, before the flow gets through the combined sewer overflow point in terms of uh, uh, assessing the water level conditions there, you know, uh, are there any local blockages that would lead to increased uh, water levels and thereby reduce the capacity of the system uh, to uh, convey combined sewage to the treatment plant. So this is for preventive uh, maintenance that we do. And the reason it's not done in all, all locations is uh, due to logistics like uh, power uh, supply availability. As you know, these are all well under the ground. Then, as a pilot effort, we have been, uh, we just contracted out, and the effort is going to start next month, of monitoring the combined sewer overflow, volumetric volume, flow rates, duration of overflow at uh, five of our uh, regulators that are going into tributaries and open waters. This is a massive effort. Um, uh, just for five locations, it's going to be an approximately a million dollar effort. Uh, to put in the instrumentation to understand the flow rates due uh, to uh, complex hydraulic conditions that we have within the sewer system and how that interfaces with the tides um, when it's raining. And to supplement that, um, uh, the on the climate side, we have, we have nine uh, rain gauges that complement what the NOAA gauges are providing. And also we are put putting new instrumentation on floating of our treatment plants to get additional information on the climate. Um, you already are familiar with the other public advisory systems like uh, a million dollar effort that our commissioner referred to yesterday in terms of changing the uh, signs uh, near every CSO outfall and also we have a uh, CSO advisory webpage in uh, DP website that you could look into for 25 of our tributaries and open waters. You can see advisories you know, after a rain event. Okay. Um, to complement uh, the monitoring side, you know, the, we have invested in, uh, over the last uh, two decades on developing complex hydraulic and uh, water, uh, hydrodynamic water quality models of the entire harbor, including some of the tributaries, which are being used to develop uh, rainfall versus the potential pathogen levels uh, in the rivers that are being used to support the advisories or closer decisions that DOH is taking or for the DEP to update our CSO advisories. Um, 
this model can uh, handle the uh, fate and transport of uh, various pathogenic organisms. And then, the, in addition, we have developed the regional bypass models, which are slightly uh, simplified versions of the complex models to be able to assess what the fate and transport of uh, emergency spills like the North River uh, treatment plant uh, incident last year. Uh, where are we going from here? You know, we are investing a number in a number of initi initiatives. I'll just uh, give a highlight of a couple. Uh, more in this particular, uh, you know, avenue, we will be looking for academic collaborations to be able to develop information to further support our public notification, etc. One of them is uh, the uh, rapid pathogen detection technologies that can give us an idea of uh, the pathogenic impairments in uh, our bodies much sooner than the traditional culture-based methods that can take up to two days to develop that info. Uh, improve the uh, public notification process. You know, we are currently using rainfall as the threshold, but we could use additional measures like the uh, our metrics like the reef heights, water temperature, etc. For example, Great Lakes is doing that, and we are thankful for that. And finally, use the models in a more forecast uh, mode to develop information ahead of a rainfall event. So these are some of the initiatives that I want to uh, uh, leave you with. Thank you. So you heard how DEP is using a sophisticated array of modeling and uh, monitors to try to gauge when CSO events are happening and starting to put that on their website. Our next speaker is coming at this from a different approach and it, I think is a great representative of, of a new movement in the environmental field of um, citizen science where everyday people are starting to measure um, impacts and share data online with new technologies and new resources to get access to information very quickly. And I'll just introduce Leaf. Thanks. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. My, my name is Leif Persifield, and um, I'm, I consider myself a creative technologist. Um, and, and from that, I develop and work with groups that develop technology that allows anyone and everyone to, to access information in a different way. Um, I, I came about the water quality issue from um, working on a project in the Gowanus Canal. Um, I was in a canoe on the Gowanus. Um, I had a, a homemade balloon made out of a mylar sleeping blanket, and we were using it to photograph the guanas from the air. Um, and I, I didn't need the photos from the guanas to tell me how bad the water was. I was six inches from it, and it was very apparent. Um, but the photos, when we, we got back and made the aerial map, really became apparent what was going on. And so I, I started doing research and trying to understand what exactly was happening. And um, I had just moved to New York, and so I started. I started doing research on, on the sewer system and, and CSOs and water quality and trying to find more information about that. And, um, the first thing I really came to was that we, we didn't really know when these were happening. And, and I think DEP has done a lot of work on that and continues to do a lot of work on that. And, and so what, what my approach was this is, is to take um, really cheap kind of small scale technology and develop a system around understanding when this happens. And the reason I wanted to do that is so that I can let people know when the sewer was overflowing and what people could do about it. Um, and and to, to do to that, I, I used this really cheap uh, hardware and developed a, a sensor that's about the size um, of a, smaller than a shoebox. Um, it cost about $300. They're, they're still being prototyped. It's, it's an evolving process of testing things, seeing what happens. But, but the real idea is that everyone here could build it. It's a kind of a plug and play. It's sort of a Lego for electronics system that, that you plug a bunch of things together and you get information out of that. And, and that really allows everyone to know what's happening, when it's happening. And then um, uh, the idea around Don't Flush Me and the kind of the system that I've, I'm working on creating is to give people an opportunity to change that, to do something about it. Um, on the scale of an individual person, if you knew what was happening, if you knew this, the sewer was overflowing, it, it basically means that your pipe um, from your house was connected directly to the harbor in, in a very loose sense, very unscientific sense. But it, it's about what happens. And so allowing people to know, hey, the, the sewer is overflowing now. Now is the time that I can engage in direct conservation. And, and that was something that I did basically for me is to, to get started was, was the idea that 
uh, this is something that I can do. And very quickly it spread and very, a lot of people are interested in trying to find out you know, what, what can they do. And then from that too, you, you get the notification about the water quality. You, you hopefully know what's happening in the water near you, you know whether or not today would be a great day to go boating. Um, and, and the idea of the system is completely open. So people could develop these sensors and put them out in their, on their boat dock anywhere they were interested in participating. And people can use the information and the data in, in any way they want. It's all public, it's all available on website that um, you can then take and mash up into anything. Um, I'm looking at ways to send out text message alerts, um, looking at ways, I already have a, a Twitter feed, you can follow Don't Flush Me, and um, I, I'm, using, I'm using weather data from the NOAA sensors around New York, and I've got just like really basic pro level CSO notification that it's, it's, it's very similar to what DEP is doing, but it's on a much simpler scale that just says if there's been enough rain, there's a possibility of being a, uh, having a CSO. And so that's something that I'm working to expand. Um, and then I've, I've created a, another system, an idea that um, could be scaled in different ways, of the idea of automatically um, creating an alert through colored light or through a uh, flag, that, that something is going to be reading the information about the CSO status and then changing something so that if you were walking down the park here, you could see a red flag flying in the distance and you would know right away that their CSOs are active. Um, and on the personal scale, it's something that's uh, basically a light bulb, that you could change a light bulb in your bathroom, and when the light turns red, you would know that there was a CSO happening, and you would know uh, now is not the time to do five loads of laundry and you know, commit that 150 gallons of wastewater to the system, which then goes directly to the harbor. So um, I'm really excited to be here, and uh, we've got, I think, want to ask a lot of good questions. I feel like the spirit of John Trevi lives on. And I really encourage everyone to go to the website don'tflush.me and check it out. It's very cool. So there's already been reference to the um, fire last summer at the North River Wastewater Treatment Plant, which as many of you know is located up near 125th Street in Harlem on the Hudson River and takes the wastewater from most of uh, the west side of Manhattan. They had a catastrophic fire that destroyed, well, luckily no one was um, seriously hurt, but uh, it, it took out one of the boilers, uh, um, one of their engines, and the wastewater treatment plant had a massive failure, and a, I mean, this was the CSO of all CSOs. Um, I, I don't recall the total gallons. I guess it's not a CSO, but technically it's a bypass, thank you, where the system, basically everything was just going straight into the, the river. It really was a wonderful, you know, an opportunity, as many things often are, though, for the agencies that are involved to come together, DEP, the DEC, the Coast Guard, the Department of Health, and we have Chris Boyd here from the Department of Health, to figure out, you know, how, not just to lock down the situation, but how are we going to notify the public? How could we get the word out in the quickest way possible to, to everybody, beach closures, etc. So um, this is a very, Department of Health plays a very important role in this issue. I'm going to pass it over now to Chris Boyd. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Chris Boyd. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Environmental Sciences and uh, Engineering at the Department of Health. Among the things that uh, uh, my programs do is uh, monitor beach water quality. Uh, we have about 15 million people who go to the beaches every summer. Uh, we collect about 1,500 samples a season, monitor uh, wet weather events and make public notification around that. We don't have a direct regulatory role over recreational waters uh, that are generally trafficked by human-powered folks. Uh, but we do as a health department have a role uh, in trying to help uh, shape our, our policies uh, and understand what the public health risks are associated with that activity. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, some of the different ways we're, we're thinking of, about this issue, in part because of what happened at the sewage treatment plant, because it crystallized the relative risks. Um, and it also connected uh, multiple agencies, both here and in New Jersey, uh, and in upstate. But how do we, as public health agencies, communicate a consistent message to the public about what the status is of secondary contact recreation loss? Um, and I think the conceptual shift 
from a sampling standpoint, we're talking about real monitoring sampling today, is for a long time, all of our uh, water quality efforts in the harbor were driven primarily from permitting requirements for sewage treatment plants and responses to CSOs and how sewage treatment plants were impacting the ambient overall quality of the harbor, the entire harbor. And what we're looking at now with the uh, sort of percolating efforts of the Parks Department and DEP with making water more accessible, having more people touch it, more people deal with it, is that we're shifting our monitoring focus away from just generally is the water safe for fish, which is what our driver was, right? Is the water safe for fish? Now we're contemplating is the water safe for people? And the contact of people with that water. And it's a paradigm shift in how we approach our monitoring. It's a paradigm shift in how we see uh, the harbor. Um, it shifts us away from uh, uh, a, a federally driven process. There's no federal water quality standard uh, for secondary contact. There's only a federal standard for a primary contact. So I think that's part of what we need to talk about among ourselves is what's our approach with this, with this paradigm shift? What's the right way to do the monitoring? How do we interpret that? Uh, how do we communicate that to people? Uh, how does that information get relayed to the people who run uh, facilities that provide access to the water? Uh, how does the Parks Department communicate risks to people? Do they shut down uh, boat launches in response to some circumstances versus other? Real-time monitoring the CSOs is great, but it doesn't tell you when that water recovers. Is it three days, four days, two hours? What is it? So get, simply getting a notification that there was a CSO doesn't provide enough information for people to make good public health judgments about how to use the water. So I think those are some of the things that we've got to think about, and I hope we get to talk about that today. And I will leave it with uh, hi everybody, I'm Rob Buchanan and uh, I'm part of the New York City Water Trail Association and also the Village Community Boathouse. Uh, so I guess I represent the human power boaters. Uh, I'm replacing Paul Gallet who couldn't be here today, uh, the head river keeper. One thing that he often says is that the Hudson River, the whole length of it now really is, we need to start to think about it as, as a beach. It's being used that way by people and yeah, I think it's the same point that Chris just made. How do we change our approach to assessing water for human use, the whole length of the Hudson and the harbor? So I want to just focus on two. I want to. I really want to just make two points. One is that, and to talk. One is to talk about our own water testing program, which we launched last fall. We did a short pilot program to see if a citizen water monitoring program could work, and now we've just embarked. Uh, yesterday on our on a full season citizen water testing program. So I want to talk a little bit about that and then I'd like to talk a little bit about the general issue of notification and how we how we might be able to approach that. So on the citizen water testing front, we <clears throat> realized that it's it actually is a fairly accessible technology. It's not that complicated, it's not that expensive. We went out and, and bought some kits. It's all in kit form and we uh, got volunteers and last fall we tested at about 15 sites along the shore where we launch our boats around the harbor and the reason we did that is that we, we didn't know, we weren't confident that the readings that, that the DEP was getting in the center of the channel were the same as the place where we put our boats in and we wanted to know more. And the reason we wanted to know was to put ourselves in a position to make an informed decision. I think that's one thing one, one difference between bathers at a beach and boaters in boats is that I think we have a conception of ourselves as navigators who make independent decisions, just as we would assess the weather, uh, approaching storm, we think about, we want to, want to be in control and make decisions for ourselves. So if we have more information about water quality, can we make these informed decisions? Anyway, here's, this is the citizen water testing kit. It consists of a cooling sampling bottle and it's really not much more complicated than that. We take it back to the lab and run it through an incubator and 
and assess the results. And this, I just want to show you, I think you can even really understand our results sheet. This is yesterday's sheet of results that we tested at 13 sites. And the green means that we met the EPA standards for bathing, not for boating, because as Chris says, we don't really have boating standards or secondary standards. But at 13 sites on Thursday morning, uh, the sampling that we did indicated that the water was okay. And the yellow site is from the Gowanus Canal, and actually it's fairly close to the bottom end of the, of the scale. So pretty good results all across. That doesn't mean anything unless we really amass a season or two seasons or three seasons of data. It's a long project and we have to keep going. And this is not, the point is not to create a yes no decision for people on the weekend, but to amass a database that you could use to predict what's going to happen, how many days after it rains does your site tend to, to be clean, that kind of thing. So that's where we started and uh, we hope that it, it really does contribute to the wider picture of water quality across the harbor. Um, and the, the other, quickly, the, the last point I wanted to make is that um, there is a, a law proposed that's sitting in the assembly right now called the Sewage Right to Know Law. And what it, what it requires is that the sewage treatment plant operators across the state inform the public when there is a discharge. And I think, you know, how they inform it and, and you know, what, what the thresholds are um, uh, is still kind of being debated and we'll see what, what what happens, but the basic principle of if a public water treatment facility has information, should they share it with the public? And I think that uh, there's a real move now to share that information and have everybody be in there. We really can't go back to not knowing. We've got to go forward to know and share everything we can. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Chris. So, um, no cards should be circulating around the audience. If you have them, you want to hold them up and people will bring them up here. Um, so I'll just ask a question in the meantime while we're waiting for the cards. And I guess, so you heard sort of two versions of citizen science. One a little, a little bit more high tech, one totally, I'll just say low tech. Okay. Um, but for, for uh, Leaf and Rob, what do, you think that the, what do you think that the governmental agencies could provide or do to make what you do easier? And how, did, how would you like to see what you do kind of tie into what government agencies are doing? Um, so for my work, I think uh, a, a big issue with that information is um, viability of the data. And, and in some ways, I, I think that there's there's always a threshold of is is the data viable? Is it meaningful? Is it uh, quantifiable in terms of standards? And um, and I think in some ways, I'll, I'll quantify this and say in some ways it's sort of irrelevant. I think the, the standards of the testing that um, Rob is doing and, and Rob is looking at at meeting the EPA standards and following the same testing procedures as the DEP and as Riverkeeper, so that their 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 data can be quantified together. Um, personally, I think that a, a lot of ways it's uh, about knowing just more information, whether you whether or not um, we have a metric to go along with that. And my work, in a lot of ways, is unquantified in that. I, I use um, testing equipment that is standard and can be calibrated, but um, in a lot of ways it's very wildly inaccurate in terms of water testing standards. But it, it gives you a really good range. It says, yes, this is higher than it was before. Um, this is definitely out of range. This is not normal. Um, and so finding a way that the government can use that, uh, regulators can use that information, not necessarily as a, as a, as a be all end all standard, but as a, a point of reference for people to, to create. I think that, that that's what I'm really looking for is to, to try to find this middle ground where people can collect information maybe anecdotally, maybe through sensors, maybe through water sampling, that says, I noticed that it was bad. Um, how bad, I don't know, but it was definitely worse than it was yesterday. And, and trying to log that and, and add that into the mix. So that's what I'm really kind of interested in, trying to, to find where, where this kind of gray area can fit. Okay, so we'll go, we'll go to the questions, which um, a couple of the first ones are New Jersey-centered. So, um, I'll, I'll turn the first one it was, what is the impact of New Jersey's fractured wastewater treatment authorities? How do their contributions to CSOs compare to New York City's? I'm going to hand that over to Chris. I happen to know a 
paramount about this in part because uh, 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 this week I was in New Jersey uh, talking about some of these issues. Uh, because uh, both states recognize that there needs to be coordination between uh, New York and, uh, and New Jersey. And uh, hats off to New York, uh, about 84% of the CSOs uh, are under permit in New York, which is above the national average. Uh, for the long-term control plans in, in New Jersey, about 5% are under permit. And so New Jersey faces a lot of challenges in terms of developing a, 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 a coordinated long-term control plan for CSOs. They recognize it's a problem. And I don't think, I don't know what the, the, the solution is going to be there. Um, my, my guess is the solution for them needs to be along the lines of Agreed upon authority among multiple municipalities and uh, utilities. Uh, they've got a very fractured system. You know, a municipality owns the CSO, but doesn't own the, the pipe that goes to the CSO. The treatment plant is run by a private entity, which isn't connected to any of the municipalities that flow waste through it. So it's a very fractured system, and I think the only way they're going to get through it is to. Uh, I'm not quite sure why the EPA comes and gives us consent orders all the time when you've got no compliance with Jersey. But a consent order process might be the, might be the mechanism to get everybody to the table to come up with a solution. And um, figuring out how they contribute to this side of the harbor is part of the policy and information collection coordination we have to do with the models uh, that DEP works with. So understanding what the influence is one way or the other. Um, is part of our process that we've got to go through um, and look at that data and see whether or not there's migration in Buffalo Harbor or whether we get stuck on that side. Great, thanks. Um, this next question is uh, for um, DEP. Would you like a university to help you publish the data from your currently installed sensors as well as your hydrological models? If not, what would help? Uh, certainly, you know, one of the future initiatives is to look at uh, collaborations with uh, academic partners and test the technologies. You know, the issue we have uh, is we are familiar with, for example, what uh, Stevens has uh, worked on more on the hydrodynamic uh, water quality, sorry, hydrodynamic modeling in the harbor and developing a 48 hour forecast. And one of the things that we looked at, we had a call with them two weeks ago what it would take to kind of extend that methodology to uh, uh, the water quality conditions. So uh, these are all explorations that we will be making. And if you have some additional suggestions, I know Alan uh, Cohn here, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, he has been talking to someone at the City College about the hydrological network. They have helped uh, the DEP in setting up the meteorological network for the reservoir system. So there is a, a you know discussion we are having about you know about how can we kind of piggyback on that in order to develop information uh, for the city sewer system as well. So. If you have specific suggestions, please uh, you know, uh, feel free to forward to us. We will consider them. Thanks. Has the medical industry done research on primary and secondary contact impacts? And um, can we identify point sources for pollutants? Well, maybe let's just take that in two pieces. So the medical industry and research, I'm assuming, Chris, you have some, some sense of that, or maybe Rob, too? <coughs> Uh, like I said, there isn't a federal standard for a secondary contact. Part of the reason there's not a federal standard for secondary contact is uh, the federal government hasn't coordinated the uh, epidemiological research over what the risk factors are for secondary contact. So we are uh, a variety of folks, both from academia and from regulatory government, uh, the government side, are are looking at what those numbers should be. Uh, we've got numbers. Uh, we got classifications. Uh, the, 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 the risk relationship between those classifications is not uh, crystal clear in terms of at what point do we feel that 
that the risk is uh, not acceptable uh, from a public health perspective. And uh, there was recently a nice study that came out of Chicago where they looked at the Chicago River, where they looked at the, uh, the, the impacts uh, on uh, human-powered voters. And what they found was that there was uh, statistically an increase in GI risk uh, to folks who are voting That last sentence repeated. I'm seeing some stressed out faces there. Okay. So, uh, some folks in Chicago uh, did a direct survey of uh, human powered voters uh, on the Chicago River, um, and they found a statistical relationship between GI illness uh, and being on the water. They found uh, that statistical relationship uh, both in folks who were voting on waters that were classified as swimmable and those who were voting on waters that were classified as swimmable. So uh, that leads us to, to believe that there, there are risks. We know there are risks. Uh, and that's the kind of research that is ongoing in other parts of the country as we all start to dig in a little deeper on this issue, uh, track actual outcomes or behavior. Uh, and try to link that with uh, the levels of, of pathogens we expect in the water. Um, and as we get more data, we'll be able to become more precise in terms of the level of risk. Um, some states have set secondary contact standards, or Texas has. Um, uh, state DEC does have a secondary contact standard. Um, I don't know how well that standard is based on that being enough. Just said, this is a follow-up question from someone just to help define terms um, and then direct it again to you, Chris. What does under permit mean? I guess you were just talking about facilities in New Jersey not being un under permit. And then, I guess, define, um, you know, in a nutshell, define secondary and primary contact. Okay, under permit. It, it, if you've got a CSO and you're uh, a sewage treatment plant, it's probably a deep question. Um, the state regulator uh, needs to put you on a permit. So you've got to have a plan uh, for how you're going to control the CSO discharge. EPA wants to see uh, uh, less than four discharges uh, if possible. You've got to come up with a variety of techniques uh, to reduce the pathogen loading that comes out of that CSO. You've got to have a strategy to control floatables. DEP has invested about $7 billion um, uh, over the last uh, decade or so uh, to deal with this long-term control plan. It's got several billion dollars more that's in the offing, so this is a Herculean amount of money uh, to address an issue that the EPA has not connected very well with uh, human, human illness. We are more than good about the fish. Um, and the other question is, uh, primary contact is uh, where we anticipate that you're going to swallow a fair amount of water that's swimming, uh, that's scuba diving, that's windsurfing, uh, things of that nature where we think that you're probably going to take a 